How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. The churches of Christ are experiencing shock and heartache all over America as they are being torn asunder by those who wish to restructure the Lord's church. The church is under siege from within. Many, if not most, of our Christian colleges are promoting this restructuring, this illicit change in the Lord's church. Many of our liberal brethren insist that change is necessary if the church is going to remain relevant in our modern day. Today we're going to be talking about the change movement. My name is Tom Moore. I'm one of the instructors at the uh, Texas School of Preaching. Uh, and with me today in our podcast, the Biblical Christianity Podcast, as usual, Mornay Stefanis, one of our instructors. And also we have with us David uh, Johnson, who is one of our uh, for, uh, second year students, about ready to graduate, but he's also been preaching in Marlin for several years, and we're excited to have him with us in our podcast today. We are noticed that in Jude verse 3, we see blood, while it was, I was giving all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, I was constrained to write unto you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered unto the saints. My friends, we need to speak out against this change that's being propagated in the Lord's church today. And why should we speak out? Well, we need to speak out because we need to alert the sleeping giant of our brotherhood and warn them of this Trojan horse that's in our midst. We need to give help and encouragement to those who are racked by the destructive efforts of this illicit change. And we need to reaffirm the simple truth of God's word to all who will listen. When we think about this change movement, Mornay, Uh, we realize that uh, at the root of this illicit change in the Lord's church, there is some cultural issues that that really are the root of our problem today. Is that not right? Yeah, you know, first of all, uh, you know, we're in in the studio this morning. Just a little bit of change for us as we're here a little bit early in the morning. And so uh, you look at that change, and that was that was necessary to accommodate <laughs> yes. whatever needed to be done. And I think that's that's important for us to to look at when we're look at the uh, the concept of change. We're not talking about change that will benefit. Uh, the local congregation or the church in general, there are many things that we've changed over the years, many many practices that have been changed that were of an expedient nature. And I think that's the, the key here is that there are those who desire to change the doctrines of God. They try, desire to change the worship of God. They desire to change the will of God in relation to uh, many things within the Scriptures. Those are the things about which we want to talk because those are the things that are destructive. We're not talking about changing the way we operate in an expedient fashion. You know, we, uh, we're we not going by on horseback to go evangelize. We've mm-hmm. got different methods and we've used different methods. And so I think it's important that we, we note that change. You know, some things has to change. Some things have to, ch- some things have to change. Some things have to, to change within, uh, if we want to progress, you know, change. Uh, uh, in certain areas is certainly valid, but it is not valid when it violates the will of God. And that is the key or the theme, rather, of what we're trying to discuss, Dave. I worked for almost 30 years in state government, and change in and of itself isn't necessarily wrong. It's not a bad thing. Within state government, we had a group that was, uh, that was titled Change Management. And the focus of the group is we don't want to change just for change's sake, People have a a proclivity to change sometimes just because, well, things have gotten dry, things have gotten uh, a little uh, not the way that we want them to go. So uh, we want to add a little invigoration to the agency. That's that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about change that is 
necessary but just for change sake, but change that, that as Brother Mornay said, gets to the very foundation of what we are and what our core mm-hmm. principles are. Exactly right. And so as we begin to delve into this idea of uh, illicit, let's just call it illicit change. Yes. Uh, American civilization has managed to survive the devastating and catastrophic effects of economic depression and world war uh, throughout the years. Uh, The post-war era brought optimism, technological change, material prosperity. Uh, Into this generation came uh, the generations of the 50s and 60s, uh, the baby boomers, of which I am a member. Uh, And uh, their parents were anxious to give their kids uh, what they did not have in the 30s and 40s. And what we're talking about here is the root behind all the change that we're having today. When we look back and we see what caused these changes, we better maybe understand why it's going on. Uh, The kids who were being raised up in the 50s and the 60s didn't learn sacrifice. Uh, They were provided a pleasant existence, and religious interests were integrated into a comfortable lifestyle. But there was something that happened in the 60s. The uncontrolled nature of rock and roll. There was motorcycle gangs, hippies, drug use began to appear. There was all the, always the uh, Vietnam shakeup that you remember. Uh, there was a generation gap that they were always discussing. Uh, there was the idea of do your own thing. Uh, all of these things were as a result of the baby boomer. Uh, that well. It was causing the difficulty of change. And what's interesting to me is that the baby boomers now and also their children are now the ones who are the movers and shakers of our day. And now these baby boomers and their children are trying to restructure the church like they tried to restructure society in the 60s. And they're trying to redefine terms. They're trying to accommodate the change that they desire. Instead, as Mornay mentioned earlier, change that's good, they're trying to change the way God's Word is presented. Yeah, and you know, when when you think about it, we talked about uh, in the last number of podcasts, we talked about influence. I think one of our podcasts, we talked about the influence and how we are influenced by information mm-hmm. and we are influenced by that which surround us. In our last segment, uh, the previous podcast, we talked about the political influence and the Christian's influence uh, in the political realm, but also its influence on us and how we're not separate from it. Uh, here we can clearly see the influence of the cultural effects in, in a country, in a nation, wherever you are in a society. Whatever cultural changes happens, the church has to guard against being influenced in a negative way by the culture that is trending. Mm-hmm. Uh, many people would li- like to say, well, we need to change with the times. That's the world's view of, of, of Scripture. Well, the Bible is culturally outdated. And that's an insult to God because what you're saying is that God uh, wrote a book that is not uh, timeless. God wrote a book that was only specific to a specific culture, and He didn't foresee what we would need in this culture. That is absolutely blasphemous. And so there is a danger, as you said, as, as these changes happened, and it happened in our society, there was a danger there, and, and members of the body should have stood up and and said, listen, here's a danger here. We need to make sure that we are cautious Mm -hmm. as we approach these, uh, as we look at what we want to change. Let's make sure that we hold on to the Word of God. But obviously that's not what happened. We took uh, courses at the Texas School of Preaching that dealt specifically with, in our hermeneutics class, dealing with uh, some of these proponents of change that stretch all the way back to the 50s and 60s and, and early 70s people like Hicks and, and Ulbrich and others, people that wrote books that encouraged uh, encouraged members of the church to abandon what we would consider traditional methods of deriving the way we should and shouldn't do things. CINI, C-E-N-I, as uh, we often uh, use the acronym, command, example, necessary inference. In everything that we do religiously, that's, the, that's how we derive the authority to do such things. And their appeal was to abandon that hermeneutic, that, that method of deriving how and what we do, or, or the reason we do things that we do religiously, and 
uh, move to a more what they called an advanced hermeneutic or a, a, a new hermeneutic or, or something of that nature. And it simply abandons God's core principles, as we said a moment ago, from the very onset. Look at Leviticus, look at Deuteronomy, and the way God deals with people through the balance of time, he has an expectation that we follow his will no matter what civilization or culture that we live in. Exactly. So Ian, when we think about, and all, that, all that's good, good points. Uh, appreciate that, guys. We think about uh, this idea of change and the change movement. Let's look a little bit at some of the factors that really underlie the present push for change. Now, of course, we, when we talk about uh, the roots in, in the hippie movement and, and the uh, things of that nature, one of the things that really sticks out and really even to this very day that's affecting the church and people pushing for change is materialism. Materialism, material prosperity contained within a subtle deceptive bar, and barb, and it, people who are in, uh, involved in materialism, who are thinking about the things of this world more importantly, they're beginning to have a tendency to forget God. I'm reminded of uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter uh, 8, beginning in verse 7, it says, For Jehovah thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks and waters, of fountains and springs flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without uh, scarceness, Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig copper, and thou shalt eat and be full, and thou shalt bless Jehovah thy God for the good of the land which thou hast given. But then notice the warning he gives. Beware, lest thou forget Jehovah thy God in not keeping his commandments and his ordinances. You know, I think, Mornay, we get ourselves, our world gets ourselves in big trouble when we, uh, you know, and we live in a country that we might be griping about it right now, but uh, compared to other countries, we are living living the high life, if you will. Yep. And many people are beginning to f- forget God and focus more on the almighty dollar, and that's promoting people who want to change things in the Lord's church. Yeah, always, uh, as we talked about a, a number of months ago, as we were sitting around talking about the inflation and we're, we're talking about how, uh, you know, in, in certain sectors it's very difficult. But yet, uh, as a whole, when you look at this nation, you still see football stadiums. That was during football season. You saw football stadiums just full. So obviously it's not that bad. You know, yeah. when, you, when you consider it, it's not that bad. You're not, Especially the cost you, of tickets these yeah, days, Yeah, the cost right? of tickets, it's not that bad. And so there is certainly, we, we don't want to diminish individuals who certainly are struggling and, and not able to even pay for groceries. We don't want to diminish that. But at the same time, we also have to recognize where this nation is in, in terms of prosperity. It is a very prosperous nation. And that prosperity, there's an inherent danger in there, in that, in the mindset, at least, or how we treat it, not in the prosperity, but there's a danger there if we become too comfortable with that prosperity and shift our focus from the prosperity to, uh, from God, rather, to the prosperity in trying to have our peace and our security in that prosperity, and that's where materialism comes in. It is the shift of focus of from God, and I'm no longer relying on God. I'm, I'm, I'm trusting in the things that I have in this life, and that's what God warned Israel about. When you come into the land and you see all of the things that I have blessed you with, you see the way that I have blessed you and, and the, the houses that you did not build, the vineyards that you did not plant, do not forget God. There's an inherent warning in there. God knew what was going to happen, uh, or the potential, rather, of, of what could happen if people allowed themselves to be influenced by their material things. And so, once again, here we have a culture in our society. We're, we're a, very, a country that is materially blessed, and we have to be careful not to allow that to influence us. But as we talk about this change, that's exactly what happened, a, a, a change because of the, the, the prosperity that we have. It happened in Moses' day. They approached Jeshurun, and when he got when he gets to Jeshurun by inspiration, Moses says, "You have waxed fat and kicked because of your 
goodness that God has blessed you with, mm -hmm. you've forsaken God, turned to idols, and have be become <clears throat> complacent in your service to God and turned and, and leaned upon all of your material possessions. Yeah. You know, it's very clear that uh, materialism is behind the ideology of a lot of people's uh, religious views, and it's their, uh, really materialism is a person's worldview many times and how they uh, interpret the scriptures and even some of our false doctrines that are present with us today, I think, have stem from the idea of materialism. But also agnosticism. You know, a lot of people hear something about agnosticism, and that might be a big word or some word they've not understood, but they understand the idea of the person who says, you cannot know truth. Yeah, you know, Jesus clearly said that you can know the truth. He says, if you abide in my word, then are you my disciples. In John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32 uh, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And then someone else comes along and says, well, you cannot know the truth, Dave. You cannot, uh, you cannot understand the truth. You cannot know the truth. And although we, uh, at times when we've studied the Scriptures in the past, we've looked at that, that concept of agnosticism, uh, you know, agonosco, to, to not know, to, the negative there, to, to not know certain things. And so we looked at that from a from within the body of Christ, and we looked outside, and we looked at individuals outside of the body of Christ who would proclaim that you just cannot know this and cannot know uh, that. And now, as we are looking at this change movement, we are seeing that within the body of Christ mm -hmm. where we have uh, preachers of the gospel, so-called preachers of the gospel, who are proclaiming that we just cannot know some of the most basic tenets of Christianity, the doctrine of heaven and where that's going to be, yeah. whether it's going to be on earth or whether it's going to be uh, somewhere else. Apparently, we just cannot know. It's now a matter of opinion. That's the type of change agents we are talking about. That's the changes that are being brought in. And it, it stems from this agnosticism, this idea that, that obviously is not a new sin. Uh, uh, John mentions it as well in his epistles. Look at the implications of, of accepting agnosticism. I, there's a standard of authority. There's a standard of, of uh, expectation of behavior. But if I, well, I just simply can't know and there's no way anyone can know, the implications of that are, well, I'm free to do whatever I yes. decide I want to do. But God's very clear in Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and following, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness mm -hmm. through the knowledge of him who called you under the glory and virtue. As he continues through that, that particular text, he begins with a thought of, of adding to your faith knowledge, and then he concludes with a very interesting term resulting in knowledge, which in the Greek epi, epigonosco, and a full knowledge, mm -hmm. a, a fully revealed <clears throat> knowledge. If we start with faith... And upon that, add knowledge, and then all of the virtues that, that make us who we are and what we should be in, in God's uh, way of viewing things according to the Scriptures, we can get to a full knowledge, a mature knowledge. Yeah, most definitely. You know, so this idea of agnosticism, you, you can't know, uh, really leads into, to me, two serious uh, problems. First of all, it blurs what is right and wrong. Uh, people, you know, they start talking about all these gray areas. Well, I don't really know if it's right or wrong because I really can't know. And then also, they, they view almost everything in a subjective matter. Well, you know, what I feel, you know, and instead of a, uh, an objective matter, but so they're subject to their own feelings because they feel like we really, we really can't know. And in reality, Tom, that's an indictment against God. It Absolutely. is. God's yeah. not powerful enough to give me clear and concisely uh, his requirements for me. And therefore, if I'm going to reject that, then again, it's an indictment against God. Yeah, and if you can't know what God's telling you, then it's probably because you've not given enough attention to the Word of God. You know, you're just uh, lacking. But here's another thing that really is, a, I think, a big problem with regard to uh, uh, a factor that pushes uh, for this uh, illicit change, and that is people's aversion to being judgmental. 
Nobody today likes to tell anybody they're wrong. You know, we hear a lot about being politically correct and you can't, you know, you don't judge me and all that type of mentality. And where that way moral absolutes have really been removed because nobody wants to be judgmental. Yeah, when you look at moral absolutes, you know, George Barna in a survey of American moral behavior, he said the following, or at least the, the website said, in postmodern society, people do not acknowledge any moral absolutes. If a person feels justified in engaging in a specific behavior, then they do not make a connection with the immoral nature of that action. So here we have a society, a postmodern society, as has been evident for, the, for, for a long time, that believe that they can do whatever they want to do. They believe they can have their truth and you can have your truth. However, the underlying result of that or consequent of that is, if I believe that whatever I want to do is true, then of necessity you cannot judge me. Mm -hmm. You cannot tell me that I am wrong because I have my own standard of truth, I have my own morality of truth. So I really do believe the, the, the concept of don't judge me stems is, is a consequent. Uh, is a symptom of a, a postmodern mindset where, you know, we cannot judge anyone, where we have seen this even in the body of Christ, as we're trying to focus specifically on the <clears throat> body of Christ. We've seen this as we uh, have rightly called out those who, stu who stood for things that were contrary to God and uh, did so in a public way. When we then spoke out against uh, mm -hmm. those things, what happened? We were attacked and, and we were told that you are judging that you are doing something that is, uh, you know, that is wrong. Well, they're doing and the very thing they accused yeah, us of, right? And so that's that's the the concept of a postmodern mindset, and the symptom is this judgment that we're not supposed to to give, even though God, Dave, uh, you know, he clearly said, you know, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. John seven and verse twenty four. Those who would that are proponents of the of of their thought that there is no. Morally speaking, there is no moral absolutes is self-contradictory. Yeah. Because that in and of itself is a moral absolute. Yeah. And I can't I can't say that there are no moral absolutes while claiming that there is at least one moral absolute. Yeah. And it, that's what you can't judge, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it makes no sense. You know, there's another thing that's really, I think, plaguing the church and is really that which is um, underlying this whole change illicit change attitude, and that is uh, the lack of discipline that's in our world today. We have a lack of discipline in the church, a lack of discipline in the world. Uh, people are getting uh, lazy and lax uh, in their Bible studies. You look around in our world today, and we have so many people who are uh, living off the government who are fully capable of working, but they would rather not work. Uh, and, you know, that kind of mentality begins to seep into the church, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, when we think about a lack of discipline, just from a basic standpoint, uh, as you talked about the lack of poor work ethic, uh, as we talk about uh, the lack of approach to certain things, there's a lackadaisical movement. I think it goes back to what you talked about in the beginning about the, the movement where parents try to give their children everything they didn't have, and the one thing they did not give them is a sense of discipline or understanding mm -hmm. of discipline. Yes. And so what you have today is the results. They have, you have all of the results of that where children, essentially, they stand with their hand out, and they are confused as to the fact as why they're not getting what they want. without you know They, they don't understand why they're not getting it. They don't understand the concept of discipline. They don't understand the concept of applying themselves and so with that in our society, and our, our listeners can readily see this, turn on the television, what you will find is the quick fix, is the easy this and easy that, you know, have, you can have all of these things without employing any discipline, without doing any work, uh, and, and that is the, the mindset of, of the world. Do as little work as possible and expect as much as possible. You know, take and, a little you know, pill and lose fifty pounds. Yes. right. Uh, you d don't put in the work. Don't don't worry about your. Uh, you know, don't worry about self control. Don't worry about doing any of those things. Just here's the easy way out, so that you don't have to do anything. And that lack of discipline, then, uh, when you do that, you you tend to uh, you know start losing focus. You know of of that which is important because it breeds this this easy lifestyle mm -hmm. to where I'm sitting in my recliner with my hands full 
as the Proverbs writer says, you know, a little bit of sleep, a little bit of that, because I'm not disciplined. I'm like, Isn't yeah. that what the uh, virtual worship has promoted among the brethren? Uh, that type of ease and sitting back. I can just stay in my pajamas and worship God. Don't have to get up and get dressed or get ready or anything like that. Yep. No sacrifice. Yep. No sacrifice. We live in a disposable society, um, and I'm thankful for many of the, the technological advancements that we've we've gotten to the point to. We can... We can store food and uh, where it's safe and consume that uh, readily. We pop it in a microwave. Uh, we have a full meal within a minute and a half. Uh, those things are advancements, but yes, there's no work to those things. Those things are in and of themselves not sinful, and in fact, they're good. When we relate that to, well, I need instant Christianity. I need. I need to. Uh, uh, I want my. Christianity in a coffee pod where I can put it in a in a Keurig and and have a cup of coffee that quickly. That's not how this thing works. I, I think that's that's why we've gotten to so many what people call versions. They're more perversions or interpretations. Someone's interpretation of the Bible. It's because of spiritual laziness. Exactly right. I'm thinking of First Corinthians 15 and verse 58, where mm-hmm. Paul says, "Be steadfast, unmovable." always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Christianity is something that we need to strive for. We can't just sit back in a recliner and expect it to come to us. Yeah, it, how do we see this? We're trying to make application here to, the, uh, to, to our listeners. We want to make sure that we're right in the sight of the Lord. How do we see this in the body of Christ, this, this lack of discipline in the body of Christ? I think it comes through in one aspect that we may not realize. It comes through in our evangelistic efforts. Yes. Have you ever noticed that it's, it, it is as if we're trying to find ways in which to evangelize that requires the least amount of effort, mm-hmm. right? And I'm not saying that evangelizing in an expedient way that does, you know, that does help us as far as logistics is concerned where we don't have to do that much in order to accomplish something because of the, the cost involved. But even that being said, the mindset that many have today is let's try to do as little as possible and we want the, the, the biggest result. And now you're starting to cut corners, yeah. right? We want to grow our, our congregation. And so, well, listen... Let's just change the way we preach or change the way we evangelize. I heard a podcast just recently. Uh, somebody had handed me a podcast about a, a very well-known preacher in, in our brotherhood who said that he had studied now for over 50 years and finally came to a different understanding of Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses 18 through 20, about how we're supposed to evangelize. And I say, you've studied for, for 50 years and you got this thing wrong? Listen, I, I don't know that I want to listen to you yeah. after that. Uh, because for, for, for 50 years, for more, than, for, for more than 2,000 years, apparently, you know, we've had the concept right, but now we're, we're not doing it right. And his whole approach to, to evangelism was to, to basically shorten it to teach just one specific thing. And, and there was nothing inherently wrong with what he was saying but the the concept there the mindset there was just a you know we need to look at scripture differently and we need to change the way we evangelize to make it easier and by leaving off certain things as he would talk about in in later of his podcast i think brother morning hit it on the head when we he said when you talk about cutting corners there's a difference there's a, a stark difference between streamlining a process and cutting corners um i don't want to I don't want to take my vehicle to a mechanic that cuts corners. I don't mind taking one, my vehicle to a mechanic that has streamlined this process. Exactly right. And not only is the process being um, made easier, if you will, but they're always also expecting less of those whom they go to. We want to work less. We expect less of you. And as a result of that, we have people coming in who are not truly converted uh, to Christianity. It has been a great time today. We have a lot more we want to talk about in in other podcasts about this change movement. But today we've talked about uh, the importance of uh, these cultural event uh, currents that are are taking place in our society and how they've changed the church. We we talked about uh, materialism and agnosticism and people who are adverse to being judgmental and and the lack of discipline that's in our world today. 
Uh, we need to be sure that we look at those things and cut them off at the root so that they don't continue to trouble the church and change the church in an illicit fashion. We're so thankful that you've been with us today as we've discussed things in the Christian uh, Biblical Christian po- Podcast, uh, and we hope that if you have any questions about what we discussed or if you have uh, any uh, issues that you would like for us to discuss, maybe a doctrinal question, we'll be more than happy to discuss those. You'll notice at the end of the podcast there's an a email address that you can write to us, pros, you like what we did, you hate what we did, uh, you want us to see us talk about this, feel free to uh, contact us and we'll give you a biblical answer. Thanks for being with us today.